Hello folks, welcome to Scratch the Surface, I'm E.J. Scott. Today my guest is Eric Olson. I think I'm saying it right, it's either Olson or Olison. Um, he is the new showrunner of Daredevil Season 3, of Netflix's Marvel's Daredevil uh, Season 3. So if you have not seen Season 3 yet, I highly recommend you go do that right this instant and uh, come back uh, after you do that because we are going to spoil the hell out of Season 3. Um, and before I get to what we talked about, I'd like to give myself a plug. Follow me on it, on Twitter at EJ Scott and the podcast at EJ Podcast, Instagram at EJ Scott 1106. My website is ejscott.com. There's a documentary about me called Running Blind, where you can see me run 12 marathons in 12 states in 12 months in 2012 blindfolded. Why did I do that? Well, because I'm I'm going blind from an eye disease called choroideremia, and it runs in my family. My grandfather was blind from it. My brother is legally blind and going blind from it. I am legally blind and going blind from it. Uh, and I have two nephews that also have it. So it's it's in the family, and uh, it's important that uh, that uh, something something is done and that more attention uh, be directed towards it. So I'm always looking to raise uh, awareness and money. So go check that out. And only for two or three dollars, you can own a digital copy of it on uh, iTunes, Google Play, or Amazon. So that would be very helpful if you could go check that out. Thank you. Um, and to learn more about choroideremia, go to curechm.org. Great. Now, Eric Olson. Um, we talk We talk a lot about what it's like to be uh, the new showrunner uh, of a show that he wasn't writing on already. He just kind of slipped into the third season of it and, and what that's like, you know, following we, the Stephen tonight was season one showrunner, Doug Petrie and Marco Ramirez were showrunners of season two. And now he's the, he's a showrunner of season three. And what, what is that like? And, um, uh, we talk in, in, in great detail. He talks a lot about um, his ideas and the show and meaning, and he gets really, really deep into his detail of his thinking process. Um, so I think you'll enjoy it from from that perspective. We also get to talk about um, uh, uh, his his father was a spy, so we talk a bit about that, which is pretty cool. Um, how Eric got into being in, uh, a writer and into movies at a really young age and how he would sneak onto movie sets and stuff like that. And um, eventually he would become a script reader for a lot of big names in Hollywood. And uh, he worked on a bunch of sh TV shows like uh, Man in the High Castle and Arrow and a bunch of, a bunch of shows. But Daredevil is his first showrunner gig. And uh, we talk about the pressures of that, but also his excitement level about it. Um, and what he, what is he like as a showrunner? Um, and what is it like in a writer's room with all these different writers? How does he uh, find the, his writers? And um, it's a really interesting talk that we had. Um, so I greatly enjoyed talking with Eric. I hope you enjoy listening from October 23rd. This is my talk with Eric Olison. And action. <laughs> <laughs> you, you started it for me. Well, you're used to doing stuff like that. Hi, Eric. <laughs> Hello. How you doing? I'm excited about the reception for the show. Which show? Oh, uh, a little show called Marvel's Daredevil. Whoa. Streaming on Netflix right now. <laughs> right this instant. Well, I finished it yesterday, and I loved it. Great. So congratulations. This would have been a very awkward podcast if you were like, what have you done to the show? And I used to like it. Yeah. <laughs> This could have been a really awkward this conversation. Could be a real awkward conversation. Yeah, thankfully, thankfully, we're we're already off to a good start. Yeah, you you seem pretty happy. I'm I'm happy for you because you are. This is season three. You are the third showrunner, kind of the fourth almost, uh, because the last season two had two showrunners. Um, so you are the third technical showrunner for the show. Um, it, what what is that like coming in two seasons in and and taking over? Or something. Well, you want to honor what came before, certainly, and and um, I'm I'm eternally grateful to Jeff Loeb for 
for picking me over some others that were vying for the gig. I tried and I didn't get it. Um, I didn't get the gig. (laughs) And um, I, I think the way that I thought about it was I wanted to treat season three of the show as if it were my own run of the comics, mm-hmm. like okay. in the way that Frank Miller had his run or sure. Bendis had his and, and sure. Loeb had his, of course, with yellow, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to put my own stamp on the show. And, and so, uh, obviously there were events which had occurred in the previous seasons and in defenders, which had to be honored. Sure. Um, and, um, I wanted to to honor all of that, and yet I wanted to tell the story a little bit differently. Um, the kind of television that I most admire is emotionally honest ensemble drama where every character is treated like the protagonist of their own storyline. Um, Do you have where, an example of yeah, uh, Sopranos, show? Sopranos, Sopranos, Sopranos yeah. for instance. Sure. Um, uh, Game of Thrones does it. Yeah. Um, Breaking Bad did it. Um, um, the wire did it, uh, like, like also like handmaid's tale. Like yeah. if, if you take your pick of any prestige premium drama out there right now, um, they employ, uh, the technique of deep point of view and they employ, uh, an attitude towards their cast of characters, which is, uh, really fleshes out the ensemble so that the larger tapestry of the cast is, is, is more dimensional and the show is better as, as a result. That's my personal belief also in, in terms of storytelling, because I very much want to do, um, layered, uh, emotionally honest storytelling. And so, uh, taking over from Marco and Doug and what they did on defenders, obviously a building fell on Matt's head. And at the end of defenders, we saw that he escaped and he's on a bed and a nun is calling out for sister Maggie. So, right. So there were certain um, um, balls in the air that I had to catch and, and deal with and, and move onward from uh, with with the season. Um, and w- w- when I came in, uh, Marvel um, had a number of ideas for things that the season might contain. Loeb kind of presented a bunch of options uh, for me. He, it was it was never like a, oh this is what you're going to do. It was more like here are a bunch of things that you should consider as you are, are, are well, pitching for season three, like right. to get the job initially. Um, can can and, you say what some of the yeah, other sure. pitches were? Um, so, so they knew that Vincent D'Onofrio wanted to come back. Yeah. Uh, so the fist component was already on the table before I walked in the door. Um, the, the notion of using bullseye in the show as the physical threat for Matt was on table, as was the... Uh, ability to draw on Born Again or Guardian Devil or any of my favorite runs of the comic. Those were all things that were options presented. Um, and so Jeff Loeb and I sat down at the very beginning of the, of the process and uh, he gave me kind of this candy drawer of things that I could have in the season. And I took those and I went away to my writing cave at home and came up with a pitch for season three, which is what you watched and and kind of walked into Marvel and said, "Hey, here's the story I want to tell and the way I want to tell it." And um, can I ask, what do you walk in and say? Is it a, is it like a two sentence thing? Is it a paragraph? Is it a is it no a no? I, I mean outline? no. I I I talked to them for an hour. I laid out mm. the entire season. I'm like, here's what happens. Here's all the storylines, how they tie together. Here are the here's the hidden architecture of the season that I'm I'm thinking about. Um, Certainly, there was a lot of detail work that needed. The whole writing staff had to spend sure. a year working out. Like I, it, it, like I had the bones of it. Like I, I knew um, structurally what it what it is I wanted to do, um, and um, and then smarter writers than than I am kind of came in behind me and helped me flesh it out and 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 make it good. You know, so so um but I came in with with a whole pitch and and Jeff said, wow, you know, most people most writers don't do that. They kind of come in and they say, oh, I'm thinking about X or doing this thing from Y and and you went off and you actually figured out a whole season. And mm. and I said, was I not supposed to do that? <laughs> like I'm kind of like, did I just do a whole bunch of extra work. I could um, but uh, ultimately it won me the job. So uh, I'm glad that I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to go break the season yeah. in my house. Um, but um, you know, J- Jeff is also a 
personal friend of mine. Like we were on a writing staff together a decade ago on a show that never went to a series, an NBC show called uh, Day One, which was created by our mutual friend Jesse Alexander. J.J. Abrams did our theme music. Whoa. Like, at home. like it was just like, and, and the show. Um, How did that was, show not get made? It was the victim of a regime change at NBC. Oh. Uh, it, the show was bought by one head of NBC who was fired, and then the new head of NBC didn't want the show to go forward and mm. killed it. And so we all went home. And then the, you know, we all thought it was, you know, a wasted year of our life, but the. Mm. The unseen consequence of that is I forged a lasting friendship with Jeff Lowe. We've been friends since before there was a Marvel television. Like yeah, He yeah. told me about the the idea of him starting the Marvel TV division, and, and I thought, that's awesome. You know, Do you I say also, to him there, hey, man, you're keeping me in mind for something you know, in the future? I, I, wasn't sure, I wasn't sure whether anything would come of it, really. I, I, I didn't realize that Jeff was going to turn out to be the empire builder that that he turned out to be. He's the kingpin like, of Marvel yeah, television. Yeah, I mean, he, he did. He, he, he called me, like, when they were starting up S.H.I.E.L.D., and I met with Jeff Bell, and, and you know, at, at just to go on staff as a writer, and I didn't get that job. And and um, and, and actually, I met with, uh, with, uh, with Drew Goddard, season one, to mm. come on. Uh, and at that moment, I didn't know that he was looking to go off and do a movie and hand the reins to another showrunner. I thought I was going out for the number two job. So when I sat down with Netflix, I wasn't selling myself as somebody who could run the show. And I kicked myself afterwards, realizing that I had kind of, um, I, I was very careful in that job interview not to over, you know, never outshine the master, right? You never want to. So, so I, I didn't play my cards right in that. But honestly, I, I don't think I would have been been ready. I, I, I think what Steve Denight did was season one was brilliant, and yeah. I'm now standing on his shoulders as yeah. opposed to to building the show from scratch. I think the reason season three is getting such a great reception is due in large large part because of what both Drew and Steve figured out in season one. Like like they planted seeds that I was able to sow now yeah. and and so i'm gl- grateful that you know i i went off and did five or six or seven other shows like man in the high castle and other things where i was able to grow as an artist and get better at my craft even before i i took the reins of of season three which is officially my first time as a showrunner running season three of daredevil and so like i had another five or six seasons of experience of how not to make television shows mm-hmm. before i came on board and, and ran <laughs> this one Okay, so you did you feel confident coming in? I did, I did, because I knew the story. I knew that Marvel would have my back. Um, I also um, was there uh, a voice? Sorry, to is there a voice in you that goes, "Well, the first two were pretty good. I can't fuck it up. Don't fuck it up." Oh, sure. You don't want to be the guy that fucks it up. Yeah, no, I I didn't (laughs) want to be the guy who fucked it up. But um, I, I also wanted to build on what they had done. And yeah. and there were some things that I saw that, that uh, like I, I very much came into season three with like a checklist of things that I wanted to do a little bit differently to, to put my stamp on the show, but also to, uh, to make it more in tune with what I think is great television. Uh, and, and that included uh, kind of selling all of the executives on, a tone that I wanted to hit. I wanted to hit something between season one of the show and the Sopranos um, in terms of the way that every character was developed more deeply and, and, and with better layers. Um, I am not a believer in sidekick characters. And I know that may be blasphemy for, for some comic fans, but I believe truly that if you uh, like, everybody is the hero of their own movie. Like, so one of the early things that I wanted to do was Flesh out Karen Page, flesh out Foggy Nelson. Um, case in point with with Karen's character is, I never really understood why she flirted with Matt in season one, and then had like this brief flirtation with Foggy, and that never went anywhere. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't understand why. Right. And then she obviously forms this connection with Frank Castle, and in, in, in both Daredevil and then in Punisher, but. Like no meaningful romantic relationship was. And really, blooming. she's with me. And really, it's it, you <laughs> the know whole that, time she's those with me. showrunners were just trying to have your back, EJ. <laughs> um, but then in comes Eric Olson. He's going to screw all that. Um, but you know uh, w- w- what I wanted to do was understand the psychology of Karen Page a little bit better, um, and 
as you know, um, um, in prior seasons, my predecessors had hinted at uh, pieces of backstory for Karen Page, yeah. which um, weren't actually in alignment with one another. Mm. They, they were a little different. And uh, Deb and I spoke at the beginning of the season, and, and her great concern was that I would invent some backstory for her where she was shooting somebody to save a busload of innocent children. Mm. You know, some kind of cop-out heroic deed that she's um, feeling guilty for, but which isn't really a, a, a bad thing. And and that's, you know, I, I think with shows like this, that that is a, a real danger, you know, like you don't want to sully your, 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 your characters with any kind of moral gray, except this is Marvel's Daredevil. Like we can live in the gray and um, out of the conversation with Deb and, and I spoke to Steve Knight and Marco and, 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 you know, they both said, we, we didn't really flesh out the backstory, so go with God. You, you're, mm. you're kind of in the clear. Um, we crafted what became episode 10 of this season where we come to learn that um, Karen played this unwitting role in her, her brother's death because of you know her, her relationship with this, her drug dealer boyfriend. She was high and drunk, crashed a car after her brother had kind of charged out to save her from this guy. And, of course, she's carrying this feeling that she is somebody who is beyond redemption. So, so Karen's engine for me this season was the fear that she's unworthy of, of love because she's not a good person because of what she did for her brother. And for me, that kind of retroactively explained seasons one and two mm-hmm. and the way that she behaved. It, and, and it gave her kind of this contradiction and dimension within her character arc that then allowed me to also justify what Karen Page does in episode eight of this season, where she literally walks into the lion's den and confronts Fisk and dares him to beat her to death in front of the camera. She pokes him. Pokes she pokes him. the bear, right? Yeah. So, so like, and, and, and it's, it's a fantastic scene. Yeah. Um, and, um, by the way, I don't know if I told you this, but D'Onofrio called me up after, uh, they did that scene and he said, Holy shit! I had no idea how talented Deborah Ann Wall is. Like, Aww. and and it wasn't just he, he but he went at, on at length. He, it wasn't just that she was a talented actress. It was that she was technically brilliant and very generous off camera to help him get his performance. Like, he could not say enough nice things about Deb. Um, and and like honestly, like everybody at Marvel, Jeff I, I has said this publicly, so I'll repeat it here. But it, it, it's like the, the joke at Marvel is whatever you get into story trouble, just put Deb on screen because whatever she's doing is more interesting than anybody <laughs> else's character. And and I, you know, I, I see why he has said that. Like and and um, you know, she, she's phenomenally talented. And um, I, I, I wanted to give her, you know, I wanted to give her the space, not just to develop as a character, but also like the space to, to, for the audience to bond with her in a way that they, they may not have been able to do and kind of the juggernaut of the first couple of seasons. And so episode 10 really was um, this departure episode, which was controversial. Um, I had to fight for it, frankly, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, and, and some of the fans on, you know, I'm reading Twitter and whatever. And some of them are like, Oh, it stopped the momentum. And, and others are like, that was the most brilliant, you know, episode ever. It, yeah, it, it's, it's one of my, it's one of my personal favorites actually. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. for fans of the comics, by the way, what I was going for was if anybody knows the guardian devil run, which I do, Kevin you Smith, know, Kevin Smith yeah. Joe in the, yeah, Joe Quesada, in the church bullseye kills Karen page. Yeah. And we planted Easter eggs early on, like on the the laundry bag that Matt grabs in episode one to grab the clothes that he dresses up in and goes out to fight, you know, fight those thugs in episode one. It says Clinton Church and stencil on the side of the bag. Mm -hmm. Well, that is the name of the church in which Bullseye kills Karen Page and Guardian Devil. (laughs) And so any true hardcore fan of the comics was going to get to the end of episode nine where Fisk dispatches bullseye to go kill Karen yeah, and start episode 10 where you're in a flashback with Karen. And I structurally wanted the audience to go, Oh my this God, this is it. They're going to kill off Karen page. Yeah. They're giving her the send off episode. Yeah. That's what's happening. Yeah. That's why we're watching it's it. The fake Rooney. It's yeah. And then, and then of course, uh, it's not what you expect. Um, because I'm 
not somebody who wants to kill off one of my best players. So, so <laughs> sorry. It's, it's, so, so, uh, um, but it, it also allowed us to nod towards the born again Karen page. Well, there's even a uh, right? scene where you're where she's where Matt's unconscious and she's cradling Matt. That's right. It's kind of flipped it's, in the comics where he's holding her because she's dead. Exactly. Very famous uh, Joe Casada panel from Guardian Devil and 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 yes, we did the inverse of that and yeah. they played it on the trailer, which some of us were like, "Oh man, you gave that spoiler up!" But <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, look, I have no criticism. The Netflix marketing campaign has been unbelievable. I mean, they're. Like if there's anybody left on the planet who who hasn't seen Daredevil season three by the end of their marketing campaign, I I, I think they might just go to that person with a handheld device and 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 strap them down and force them to watch it. it it's it's been a, an amazing campaign. That was a great that was a great episode. And I know you you were hoping to do like uh, the whole episode uh, in flashback. Is that right? Um, well, well, ten, ten plays. Yes, I mean, we debated whether or not to just do an entire episode in Karen's arc, mm. um, and um, that was a bridge too far for for the powers. Do you think me. there was more you could have told? Because it was it ended up being about what like thirty ish minutes in flashback. You know, uh, I, I pushed it as far as I could, and um, you know, by ending that episode with the Guardian Devil basically church battle that ends differently than it does in the Guardian Devil comic. Yeah. Um, it felt like a, it felt like the right structure. So, um, you know, you know, the initial pushback was, can't you just do her flashback in five minutes or 10 minutes? And right. I said, no, you know, like I really wanted to do this. And, and part of it was, um, you know, we had to drive the crew upstate New York. It was no small deal to yeah. like take the whole crew on the road. That's not something that's really budgeted for. And, and, um, but, um, I felt very passionately that this was the best version of the story. And um, ultimately, Jeff Loeb and others said, okay, if you feel that strongly about it, we'll back you up. And so that's how episode 10 came into being. And as I'm, as, you know, I'm very, very proud of it. You know, I, I think that, you know, th there were a couple times where um, I had to kind of fight for stuff. Um, and Thank God they both turned out episode 10 and then the one in episode four that mm -hmm. everybody's talking about now. It's like, you know, th those were, those were kind of, four, and then also I think the theater of the mind sequence, um, in episode five where Fisk is visualizing in right. black and white, you know, the backstory of Ben Poindexter and, and we're really learning his deeper psychology. Like those are some things which expanded the the filmic vocabulary of the show and 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 that's something that i'm also a fan of like you know like let's bring in the techniques of magical realism and and the, and the premium kind of uh storytelling techniques that some of these shows are using and and use them on our show and and um those those are those were three examples where i actually expected marvel to say you're crazy olsen you're pushing your luck just you know uh, but instead, they backed it. They they backed uh, backed me up, and man, it, it's it's been kind of a it's been a dream come true, you know. So it, it, like, I'm very proud of how those those form breaking episodes turn turned out. Well, and and that uh, episode four, the the winner, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what you call it? Yeah, the winner. Um, it's an eleven minute. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it was like eleven minutes and fifteen seconds. I don't remember okay. what the final edit is. Some people have timed it at, at, at ten minutes and something, and I I don't know how or why. But but it, yeah, it's over. Ten, it's it's between ten and eleven and a half minutes. I I actually don't know the exact. Did time. you write that episode? Um, the writer who's credited with it, Lewa Nasserdine, wrote that episode. Um, but the way our writers' room works is. Every single writer writes every episode together, and we rotate whose name gets put on the script. Oh, okay. So hmm. um, I, I'm an advocate of, of team work. Um, uh, and so literally, like, I had a hand in every episode, as did Lewa, whose name is on episode four. You know, he had a big role in, you know, the other episodes that his name's not on, and, and hmm. that goes for every single writer. But the writer of the episode... Uh, Lee Nasserdeen was on set and covering the episode as its producer, and he was instrumental in in uh, uh, working with the director Alex Garcia Lopez, and then 
uh, calling me up and convincing me that we could take this insane prison riot escape sequence and do it as a one shot deal. Uh, so, um, hmm. so it's uh, his idea. The, right? Was it your idea, or did you say that? No, no, it was it? actually the director's idea. Director's uh, idea. Uh, yeah, Alex yeah. Garcia Lopez, and then he talked to the writer uh, and and the stunts department, and they all called me up together and said, uh, "Eric, we have this crazy idea." And then I had to take ownership of it and sell it up the chain of command, obviously, because um, you know it, it costs a lot of money to 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 send a crew to a location to film um, when you spend that amount of money and you tell the studio that they're actually not going to film, they're just going to rehearse, uh, you know, that, that creates, a, you know, a lot of attention, like, wait a minute, what you're going to literally call the entire crew to the set, spend the amount of money to the same amount of money to film. It is not film it, but you don't want to film it. You just want to rehearse it for a day. <laughs> um, you know, so it's unheard of, yeah, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, and, and yet again, Marvel backed it up, said, okay, if you think that this is worth it, go for it. Um, uh, and, you know, we moved some numbers around and, and made it possible. And then um, um, they knocked it out of the park. I mean, Alex Garcia Lopez, a fantastic director. And then, of course, Chris Brewster, who's Charlie's stunt double, and yeah. Charlie and the whole stunts team. And everybody worked worked it out. But it, but it required also every other member of the crew to be in perfect sync. Like the sound guy had to like hide around the corner. Right. Jeff Dutemple was the it's camera. Choreography. It was, it was, but it was like that camera weighs, I don't know how much, but it, it's like a ton. And, and Jeff, the, the camera operator had to like actually be able to, to, continuously do that scene along with Charlie who had to go do all these stunts and interchange, you know, seamlessly do cowboy switches with his stunt double Chris Brewster yeah. and then they get blood on get him. blood on him then go back into another action sequence then go Act. into a dramatic scene yeah. where he has like this really important story scene with these Albanian uh, inmates and then go straight into another action sequence that lasts for another God knows how many minutes until he ends up outside the prison and then in a taxi it, it was it was insane it was insane to try to do it and uh, it was really the enthusiasm of alex garcia lopez and the stunts team and the enthusiasm of Lee nasterdean who was the producer on set they said eric we think we can do this we really think we can do it and the assistant director uh wax and and like the whole team that just like when they pulled it off you know i was in la but I think I might have heard the cheers that happened on Staten Island at that prison thing <laughs> from Los Angeles. Right. Uh, we got the call that it had, it had worked. And, of course, there's a day delay with dailies. You know, So it wasn't until the next day that I could watch the takes and say, oh, shit, do I have it? Uh, and uh, nothing got done at Marvel that day because every executive was just watching the dailies over and over and over mm -hmm. again going, holy shit, I can't believe we actually achieved this. Off. And, and of course, um, Deb wasn't on set that day, but I'm sure she heard like the amount of adrenaline and the morale boost that that victory gave the crew carried all the way to the end of the season. It was just mm. like, we just did this epic thing that fans are going to go nuts for, you know, the, with, within the sequence itself, there were, Built-in safety nets. Um, there were some darkened hallways where yes. I would have lights been able, went on and off. Right. Yes, I would have been able to hide a cut if I had to. Um, but when I saw the final product, I actually went into post-production and I boosted the light levels in the hallway so that the audience can see for themselves that there are no hidden cuts. There's yeah. no VFX trickery. That is a true one shot 11 or so minute sequence where the crew w were geniuses like that they pull oh, I, I've never I, I've never been a part of anything like that in my career Charlie Cox would agree that it's like one of the high points of our careers like what that sequence ended up being uh in terms of action and and what we pulled off so and yeah man I'm, inc I'm incredibly proud of it and that's following up to uh, similar type of scenes from season one and season two 
where there's that hallway scene from season one, then there's like a stairwell mm-hmm. scene in, in, st- in season two. So now when that happens, now you're setting up a pattern of like, well, <laughs> now you got to do something like that in season three, right? And probably if there's a season four, now you got to well, do something Well, similar. that was season three. The hallway is season three. So you well, there, well, there was a, there was a, fir- there was a uh, hallway. Right? No, no, okay. In, in season, season one, one, it was the hallway fight. Yeah. In season two, oh, they yeah. did the stairwell with yeah. the biker gang. Yeah, and, and, which, then, and, and it's, to hear Charlie describe that, that was meant as more of an homage to the, yeah, yeah. the first season. Yeah, what, uh, what season three, we did this prison break. And I hear yeah. you. Like, If I'm lucky enough to do uh, season four yeah. and, <laughs> and the show is, is going forward... Please, Netflix, please. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we'll have to do something special. But, yeah. you know, I have some like, ideas. Does, okay, so uh, the director called you up and was like, hey, I think we could do this in one. Do you go into the writer's room for season three and go, okay, well, we have to figure out uh, an homage to those first two seasons of those massive fight scenes? It was it was, it was, was kind of in the back of my head. like, like so, so to back up for a second, because... When I took over the show, I wanted to impose certain guidelines for the action sequences. Um, um, I wanted to get away from a proscenium kind of storytelling where you're watching events from afar and you're watching great balletic action sequences involving wire stunts. And, and to, me, to me, no television show is going to be able to outdo the, the movies where they can spend a month and a half sure. shooting a single action sequence, right? Um, the strength of television is character based. And I wanted to play to the strengths of our medium, the thing that we can do better than the movies. And what we can do better than the movies is we can spend more time with characters, getting into the shoes of characters, getting into their heads. And I wanted to to approach the action sequences of Daredevil within the perspective, within the deep point of view of the characters that we're following and emotionally experience the action as they are experiencing it, as opposed to watching it from like a crane shot across the street and watching all the cool graphic, you know, comic book fighting that to me, that's, that actually would have violated kind of the principles of what I wanted to achieve with season three, which was uh, uh, at the beginning of the season, I limited the number of characters that had point of view privileges, meaning I limited the characters that the camera could follow, uh, whose experience we were going to track as an audience with the show. There were six characters initially, Matt, Foggy, Karen, Fisk, Dex, and Ray. And every single um, um, scene is inside one of those characters' heads. In, in, in the cases where, where more than one character of, uh, were in a scene, it would have been a shared point of view. But I was never going to go show a scene where uh, an extra or a day player was being followed by the camera and then revealed Daredevil watching him or something mm-hmm. like that. That violated my rule. Okay. Um, and then only when you discover the secret that Maggie is Matt's mother did I give a seventh character point of view privileges, Sister Maggie. Sure. Right? So um, that was one of my principles coming into the season. And then uh, I spoke to... This was before I I had hired any of the directors. I was working with uh, Chris Lavasseur, the director of photography, and we talked about which lenses and which kinds of angles to use to to achieve this um, emotional connection between the point of view character and the audience, and and uh, um, to build a bond where you feel like you are the character going through the experience of what is happening, as opposed to watching them from afar. And I applied that to the action sequences as well Mm. so that we are in the heads of the characters as things are happening. And it gives action sequences, especially on a television show, a grounded, gritty truth. It it, it makes it a a visceral experience in a way that um, um, you actually can't do in the movies because you haven't spent that much time really getting into the heads of the characters because you're cutting all over the world, right? Um, 
I mean, not obviously not in all movies. I'm generalizing sure. here, but but like I wanted to play to the strengths. The other thing that I did with the action sequences was, um, I wanted to make sure that there were one of several other uh, elements to an action sequence in season three. Uh, one, and these were all rules that I talked about with the writers' room, and then about with the directors, the stunts department, the editorial staff, everybody. Um, Every action sequence in season three had to have real stakes. Now, what does that mean? We know the titular character is not going to get killed off in episode four. I'm not going to kill Daredevil, right? So if I'm going to go send him into a fight, there has to be something beyond just him fighting that matters. And um, I'm not a fan of shows where you know the end of the action sequence before it begins. Like you could go make a sandwich in the kitchen, come back, and nothing changed, really. It was just like a bunch of stunt guys having a great time and it looked cool, but it didn't actually affect anything. I wanted all the fights to matter in, in this season. And one of the things like, for instance, in the, in the, uh, the prison escape sequence, what matters is that Matt doesn't have the ability to pull on a disguise, a cowl, uh, you know, the daredevil suit. Like he is just him in a prison and he's being watched on video by Wilson Fisk. So he has to employ all of the, the, the skills of Daredevil to get out of the situation alive, even knowing that Fisk is now watching him do that live and for, beyond any doubt knows now that he is Daredevil yeah. and they are the same person. So he's outing his secret identity by fighting for his life to get out of that prison. To me, that makes it a good sequence because it has real stakes, right? You're, if you're the audience, you're not just watching the fight. You have this sense of dread that oh my God, like this is going to have major ramifications for the, the secret identity and sure. for Matt and all that. So um, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to do uh, with the action sequences, I wanted to see Matt lose fights and I wanted to see him, th- th- I wanted to see there be real consequence, real world consequences and, and story changing um, um, turns based on the fact that he lost that fight, right? So in episode six, he loses the fight against Dex, fake Daredevil, mm-hmm. a.k.a. future Bullseye, <laughs> um, and the witness that they brought to the bulletin to expose Fisk is murder. Right. Right? So it's like a real consequence to Daredevil having lost that fight. The yeah. story would have gone a whole different direction if he had won that fight. But no, he's limping out of that fight sequence with a with a scissors in his in his you know in his chest, and he's got to like go pick up the pieces and figure out a new way forward you know, from episode seven onward, you know, so, so those were some of the things that I kind of brought to the season three and Mm -hmm. my concept of how to tell the story so that it would kind of scratch my nerd itch, but also, you know, like, um, that the fight sequences would matter in a way that, you know, other shows, maybe some, you know, when you see the superheroes fight, you know, you're kind of like, Oh, okay. It's fun. It's like candy. It's like, but, um, Daredevil is darker. And, and I really, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big student of storytelling structure and, and, and of, of like how to structure a story, um, in a way that every single story thread matters, every single beat matters. You're not wasting the audience's time anywhere. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I mean, we have obviously rave reviews and I'm not complaining, but there are a couple <laughs> people at the beginning who wrote like reviews about the first couple episodes are filled with filler and they're too slow. And I think part of that was because that may have been true on some other shows maybe even in our Marvel family where they kind of did do storylines that didn't go anywhere. And it was kind of, do you read all those reviews? Have you been? Yeah, I, 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 am paying attention. Yeah. (laughs) Um, um, but, but you know what those reviewers don't realize is that there is not a single beat this season that I hadn't considered and pay off that I don't pay off by the end of the season. It is, it was a tapestry that the writer's room worked very, very hard to make sure that, um, everything pays off. And to that point, one of the things that, that uh, I very much wanted to do in the, in the concept stage uh, was I, I wanted the storyline of, of Foggy Nelson, I wanted the storyline of Karen Page to be so load-bearing that if you took their story out, the story would have turned out completely differently. Mm, yeah. and, and one of the overall concepts of the season was I wanted 
to tell the story of the rise of a narcissistic tyrant who pits people against one another <laughs> using fear. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I wanted to also offer the prescription for how to defeat people like that. And the prescription to me, uh, which is embodied by the, the storyline of our three core characters, uh, is the power of the free press, the power of the law, and the power of collective action. So those are the three kind of things that can push back against you know, the rise of Emperor Palpatines in the, in the real world, you know? And and um, so I, I wanted the show to be able to do that too. But what that allowed me to do was to make each one of the storylines matter. So it's not only that I'm treating Karen or Foggy as the protagonist of their own storyline. If their storyline had not happened, the whole sh- the Fisk would have, risen to power like Matt would have been beaten like like it all will would have fallen apart so that was kind of one of the early structural ideas that I brought to Marvel in my initial pitch Mm -hmm. and and what we ended up watching well are there any um easter eggs in the show that we might have missed that you've put in oh man there's so many oh my god can you give me a few oh there's props there's like uh, like on the gate in episode 11 when when Sister Maggie is letting them into the into the basement, there's you know there's a nod to Guardian Devil in in the actual gate that we built. There's some Latin inscription on the on the gate that mm-hmm. that um, there there's you know photos on walls and the set dress. Like there are so many, and then there's also fans of the comics will see certain panels from their favorite comics um, mm-hmm. have been used in a, in, in a way that, that they'll recognize or that will echo. Um, you know, we, we basically had, at the beginning of the, of the process, um, I hired a number of writers who are even bigger geeks than I am, and we kept kind of an Easter egg basket uh, mm-hmm. on the writer's room wall of things that we might consider putting in the show, right. and we used a lot of them. But, but f- I had a couple of rules for it. Number one is that I always want to give the audience what they want, but not in the way they're expecting it, right? And especially comic fans, because if you know where the story is going, you're going to be bored. Then I'm not actually doing comic fans any service. You should be able to appreciate that we have adapted the work of Bendis or Miller or Smith, you know, but like you should be able to watch it as, as something new and fresh and exciting because it takes inspiration from, but it's new and, and it's, un, you know, unpredictable. Like, yeah. so, so that was one of the guiding principles. The other thing was I never wanted Easter eggs to overwhelm the narrative. I like, I want comic book fans to, to be able to, to recognize them and enjoy them as like an added meta layer of the season. Um, but I don't want to take, uh, an audience member who is not uh, like you or I am uh, fully versed in all of that Mm -hmm. and, and take them out of the story. I want them to be able to watch the story and just appreciate that it's a really, you know, tightly woven crime thriller yarn um, without even realizing that they just watched an Easter egg that a Marvel fan will leap off their couch and scream like, that it's the most exciting thing they've ever seen. Like I I need to be able to appeal to, to viewers that, that uh, aren't fully versed in all that. Did, did, uh, is there uh, was there talk about connecting the season to uh, infinity war with Thanos? You know what? Here's the truth. The truth is um, I didn't know about the snap until I went to the Infinity War premiere and <laughs> right, I saw yeah, it happen yeah. on the big screen. <laughs> right, right, right. And I thought, oh, shit. Because, <laughs> like, you know, as you know, uh, a Marvel is super secret and they have, like, the CIA yeah, of levels course. of access of to all sorts of information across the corporation. I was not read into sure. the snap. I had no idea that was coming. Yeah. Uh, so, now, so, so this could so, be, this is pre that. So, we'll, so we'll yes, see. so the, the answer that we've all come up with is that uh, <laughs> season three happens before the snap. Um, and I guess I'm going to have to watch what Feige does with, with the, you know, the next movie to determine whether or not a future season will have to address it or not. Yeah. Like that, that, that is one of those things that the Marvel corporate higher ups uh, are going to have to discuss and, yeah. and, and get back to me on because as, as, as much as I have tremendous freedom to shape daredevil, I am only one 
part of this gigantic umbrella of sure. shows and comics and everything else. And, and, you know, they're going to have to figure out how they want to address it, if at all, in the uh, in the Marvel uh, Netflix universe. Yeah, uh, and speaking of that, I mean, uh, uh, recently uh, there were two shows that were canceled from Marvel Netflix and Iron Fist and Luke Cage um, within like two weeks of each other, I think, yeah, something it was like, like a that. Week. It was a Friday and a Friday. A Friday and a Friday. Um, when you hear that news, and it's a bummer because Luke Cage news was on Friday when uh, season three came out, it's all yeah. these great reviews and stuff. But do you think, do you go, oh, uh, will um, there be a season four? Well, what, look, I, I mean, future I'm, hold? I'm close personal friends with Raven and with Cheo. Like yeah. uh, uh, Raven and his wife, Catherine, and Abby and I are like having Halloween party together. You know, I, like we're, we're, we're all part of a family. And, and one of the great things about joining this merry band of fools is that I've made lifelong friends with like Melissa Rosenberg and Steve Lightfoot. And, and like, we're, we're kind of a, the, the Marvel showrunner fraternity sorority kind of mm. society, you know? And, and it was very painful to, to hear that news. I helped Cheo clean out his office yesterday. Yeah. I, I took boxes down to his car for him. So, you know, oh. so it's like, you know, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Um, you know, I, I, have been told by multiple people that um, it has nothing to do with the Disney streaming service that's coming out, mm. that um, those shows were were canceled for reasons independent of kind of the, 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 <clears throat> the rise of a Disney competitor to Netflix, you know. You know, this is so far above my pay grade. I mean, yeah, this yeah. stuff happens at like the, you know, the Bob Iger level and the, you know, like the Ted, Ted Front, you know, it's yeah, yeah. like this is so far above. I I don't know whether that has anything to do with anything. All I know is that, um, and what I've been told is that Daredevil is a, is, is a huge hit for Netflix. Um, we know that the season has gotten fantastic reviews. Everybody is extremely excited about it, and um, um, like it is, it is my cautiously optimistic hope that we will be able to proceed to season four, and that I'll be a part of it. Uh, yeah. So, so that that really is, you know, all I know. I, I want to keep the family together, and I want to have everybody back who made season three. I think we, uh, in terms of the cast and crew, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, or, or excuse me, in, in terms of the crew, like the, the story will be different. I don't, I don't know yet what, what the story is going to be if, if there is one. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I have to, uh, I have to see, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to get a season four. Was there anything, uh, that you wanted to do in three that you couldn't, couldn't do? Anybody you wanted to use any plot stuff you wanted to do? Um, like well, that? that's a tricky question. Look, I, I, I mean... I Mar Marvel basically backed me up on ninety five percent of everything I wanted to do, and there were five percent maybe of things. That I, like, okay, <laughs> I have to, you know, I have that's to give good, some, That's pretty good. That's ratio, pretty good. Right? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, there there was a sharper edged ending that I was considering, mm. okay. um, but ultimately, we all agreed that um, there were future stories to tell with some characters that may have otherwise been killed off the show. And so I didn't want, like, I, I agreed that um, the way we ended it was felt satisfactory for season three and also left possibilities open for future seasons that okay. um, would have otherwise not existed. Mm, that's vague. That's vague. Yeah, vague in a way that won't get me fired. How about that? <laughs> well, uh, Jay Ali was here, and he told me, uh, they, and as a showrunner, and you're a first time showrunner, <laughs> do you uh, when you're like, oh, I'm going to be a showrunner, when you're imagining, fantasizing about being a showrunner, do you go, well, I'm a showrunner, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do things this way and that way. Do you do stuff like that? And then were you able to um, execute that when you did become a showrunner? Well, look, I, Daredevil is my 16th television series. I was second in command of seven other shows before. Yeah. Like, so in, in terms of like working my way up the ranks, working with other great showrunners, seeing 
positive examples and negative examples and kind of learning the craft and the, mm-hmm. tr- and, 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 and the work of how to run a show. Well, um, like I, I always knew I wanted to do this job. Um, uh, and, and every showrunner has his or her own style for, for the job. For me, I'm a big believer in, in teamwork. Um, um, I did something called the showrunners training program at the writer's guild, which is a fantastic kind of workshop that takes senior writers or senior pilot writers, uh, who are writer's guild members and, and holds kind of a, I guess, kind of a post grad class, uh, uh, where the major showrunners in Hollywood come through and, and give you, uh, advice, uh, hmm. over the course of, of eight or eight, eight weekends, I think. Um, That's and great. That's yeah, it's fantastic. Good. So, so there's there's a lot of shared knowledge now. The guild started this. Jeff Melvoin started the program with Carol Kirshner at the WGA. It's it is, it's it was life changing for me because, um, but but what what they talked about was that there are kind of two models of showrunner. Um, there's the um, there's the emperor or empress model. You know, the dictator model, um, where the showrunner is kind of rules by fear and limited information and, and, and there's iron certainly fist, if you will. Yeah. The iron fist. <laughs> and then there's the prime minister model. Uh, you know, somebody who, yes, they are the final say because they're the showrunner, but they really try to encourage debate, encourage everybody on the, on the team to bring forth their best work. And then, and, and that's the model that, that, that speaks the most to me. What I tried to do with season three was, um, I wanted to create a workplace where I I saw myself actually as like the bottom rung as opposed to the top, or or simultaneously both. And what I mean by like if if I'm the I, and I am the boss of the show and I set the vision for what we're doing, but then my job is also to make sure everybody who works on the show has what he or she needs to do their best work. In the case of an actor, it means make sure that. Uh, the scenes are clear. The the objectives are clear. The, you know, I'll talk to an actor about uh, all the layers of a scene and, and really workshop it with them if that's what he or she needs to to do their best work. Um, so, you know, I, I want to make sure that the the cam- you know the director of photography has the proper camera gear. I want to make sure that the director has the time to shoot it. I want to make sure that the craft service department has enough electrical cords to set up the coffee machine out on a cold, you know, mm. it, the, the, it, it, it's there's a lot of spinning plates. There's there. a lot of spinning plates, you know, and, and obviously you like, I, I have a gigantic team of really awesome people who are working on the show. Like Emma Perrazzo, one of the best line producers I've ever worked with in my entire life. Like we had a, all this, the support of all these Marvel uh, executives as well. But like every department head knew that if they strongly believed in something, um, they only had to pick up the phone or communicate to me and they would get what they believed. Like if Liz Vascola, the the costume designer believed that a certain texture of a suit was going to be more indicative of the inner journey of the character, like Liz has forgotten more about wardrobe than I will ever know in my life. I would be an idiot not to back up, back her up. Like I hired well, and then you back up your smart, talented team Mm -hmm. and and like if there's one thing that kind of i learned coming up and and even though i'd worked on 16 shows i actually my first professional experience was i was on a school bus i was 13 years old and my bus passed a movie set in my hometown in virginia and and uh i called my mom at school and i said i'm sick and and on the way home i said i'm not really sick i want you to drop me off on the set and and I kind she of did? she did she was mad but then she got over it and then I got the guy the, the assistant prop master's card because they were rapping for the day and that movie was broadcast was news? broadcast news James and Brooks. James Brooks and and I just started showing up the Teamsters were tipping me off about where to go show up to to you know where they'd be filming and I literally just started showing up so much they finally just gave me a walkie talkie and let me be a production assistant I wasn't being paid I wasn't even. I wasn't, not only was I not 18, I don't think I was even 13 or 14 at the time. So, but, you know, working, you know, on over a dozen movies through my teens, like JFK, Days of Thunder, like others, like working on the crew of movies and, and really starting to fully appreciate 
the level of dedication of each one of the crafts people, like they spend their lifetime getting good mm. at lighting or at moving a camera or at like, uh, you know, every, every single artist on that crew is like the top of what they do. And like, I get excited about learning from those people. Like I learned a tremendous amount from Chris Lavasor, our director of photography and, and, and our collaborations. Uh, likewise, from John Paisano, the composer, like in, in the post-production process, like um, I, I went to all the scoring sessions and, and uh, one of the things that John wanted to do, his ambition was to have more live musicians. And I horse traded with Marvel. I said I would spend less money purchasing Rolling Stones cues and instead put that money in a live orchestra. Uh, and, you know, we got the bassist from like John Williams. You know, it's just like you, you, you end up getting these super talented Hollywood uh, studio musicians that do all of the big movies. And, and you know, you go to a scoring stage and, and watching Paisano and then, and then the orchestrators and everything, and, and, you know, they would play a musical cue and they would look at me and say, what do you think? And, and I would say, I would speak in emotional terms, like I want to feel it more in my gut. And Paisano taught me, okay, we put the mutes on the strings and we drop the, the violins an octave and then they would play it back again. And I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. I had no idea you could do that. And then of course, you know, being the you know douchebag showrunner by episode four, I'm like, can we put the mutes on the violins and drop it an octave? And I'm sure they were all probably rolling their eyes. But you know, they were, you know, it, it's one of those, one of the most fun aspects of, of being a showrunner is I get to hire like the most insanely talented people who are literally the best at what they do. And then I get to learn from them. Mm. Like I'm their boss. Yes. But I, if I support them and I explain what it is we're trying to achieve together, they know how to give me what I want. I don't need to tell them how to give me what I want because they know more about what they do than I do. Yeah. Right. So, so I, I think that, that is my um, my approach to show running, and it, it extends across all aspects of the show. And uh, f look, I mean, f from what I can tell, it was a really fun place to work. Um, of course, I'm in my bubble, so you can <laughs> ask other people. But um, it, we, we created an atmosphere where every single person in the cast and crew felt like they were appreciated, like their their heard. craft were respected. Yeah, they were heard. Everybody, as a result, brought their A game. They all wanted to, to, to make the show better. You know, they wanted to live up to that. And, and um, it literally translated into a season of television that I, I'm insanely proud of because I, I feel like we all should be proud of it. It, yeah. it, it really, uh, it was a team sport. And, uh, and I, I mentioned earlier, Jay Ali was just here because he said... Uh, you gave people the option of knowing their arc or not knowing yes. their story arc. And he wanted to know. Yes. And, um, and at some point he found out he, it was going to be one season. And then at some point you came to him and said, you know what? We're, we're talking about keeping you alive. And he said, don't do that. He, he convinced you. So, to so well, okay. So, <clears throat> um, as part of this idea that I want to give every person on the, cast and crew what they need to do their best work some actors don't want to know what is coming they yeah. want to read every script one at a time be in the moment yeah. and not for some actors knowing what's coming uh is actually hurts their craft because they start to play the future as right. opposed to being in the moment of of that particular episode um there are other actors who actually um construct their performance in different ways like and, and telling them where everything is going helps them actually um, build their character. Um, and there's no right or wrong. It, it's really an individual choice for each craftsperson, each, each actor. So I, like I told Vincent at the beginning of the season, everything I was doing all the way up to the final finale, you know, the, the final fight in the finale. And, and that helped him. Um, and Deb, as you know, doesn't want to know. Charlie doesn't want to know. They they want to get one script at a time and just fully invest in the in the research yeah. and homework that they do every script. Um, Jay was a special case because um, um, I knew that this character was going to meet a tragic end at the end of the season, um, and um, there's there's 
two things that go into my thinking um, with that. Number one is obviously the process of that actor and and wanting to make their performance the best I can make. The other part of it is I want to be a human being and I don't want to watch an actor go purchase an apartment in New York or spend a big chunk of their salary thinking that they've just hit a gravy train that's going to pay sure. five years of income yeah. when I know that that's not true. And I've worked on television shows where showrunners kind of kept mum about a character that's going to be killed off a show uh, because they don't want the secret to get out. And that actor goes off and spends a lot of money and mm. all of a sudden is killed off the show. And suddenly you have a, 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 a really awful life situation for that, for that artist. Uh, yeah. Like it's horrible. So I knew coming into the season that um, um, Agent Nadim was was going to be the cautionary tale of what happens to good people drawn into the spider web of a Fisk like Trump like mm. character, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I knew that he was going to die, so I t basically told R or Jay that at the beginning of the season. Um, I also told Jay that you know he's a character who's not in the comic books who's I invented and, and I wanted to, um, ha, I wanted to make sure that, um, ha, there's a, there's a lot, there are a lot of things that kind of went into this factor. Um, number one is one of my goals at the beginning of the season was I wanted to diversify the cast. Uh, mm -hmm. it bugs me that daredevil was all white people. Like with a few exceptions, you had you had Royce's character, you had Brett Mahoney, and you had had Stefan, you know, uh, the Tower. Blake Tower, and and um, but um, I wanted to be part of the change that's that's helping alleviate some of that lack of diversity mm -hmm. in Hollywood, and and I very much wanted to create a a meaningful character uh, who would be played by an actor of of color, and um, Netflix said okay, but then you you know people are going to ding you for killing that character off at the end of the season. So maybe it's safer just to cast white, you know, so that nobody nobody uh, gets you. You don't get in trouble, right, mm -hmm. for killing him off. And that was you know something that was of great concern to to a lot of the executives. And and I said you know and I took that to the writers' room, which was incredibly diverse. It was like fifty percent white, fifty percent not, you know, or, or diversity. Um, and I said, look. You know, is this the the dilemma that we're in right now? I can't create this great person of color character or a character which will be this really interesting role for an actor um, because of fear of some political blowback at the end when that character meets a tragic ending. So I was kind of in this weird dilemma. And, and one of the writers on, on staff who was African-American woman said, no, you need to you need to. Just tell the story you need to tell. I mean, it is a terrific role, and 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 you would otherwise be robbing a person of color from having that role out of fear that you're being politically incorrect by killing the character at the end, right? So mm -hmm. this is real inside baseball here, yeah, EJ. Yeah. You know, but it, but it's like um, um, when I, when I spoke to Jay about it because I, I I went to JLE and I and I said, look, man, like the role that. Like I've created a role that that essentially is almost giving you as much time as Daredevil and it, it, it gets on screen. Like he is in a lot of ways the heart of the season, and um, there is no future role on any of the Marvel shows that would go as deeply into the character of Ray Nadim as this season possibly could. And as you know, um, actors realize a great death is it's like actor bait it's 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 like one of the great things that you want as an actor and the completion of his arc uh we ended it in in the right place um and jay ended up saying no absolutely kill kill me off like um honestly the other thing is like jay is gonna go be a huge star um <laughs> and um you know, he's now free to, you know, yeah. so, so it, th there were a lot of upsides, but I was very open about it. Like, um, like I wanted to have, you know, a person of color with a really 
meaningful role on the show. I, I watched uh, and Master... A, and for a guy that's not trained as an actor, I mean, even for a guy that is trained as an actor, he's, he does a stellar, stellar he, he's, job. He, he's amazing. And, and I mean, it, it, it's like, I, I regret that I'm not going to be able to work with him at... You know, or may, or am I? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe like, in the you know, but but but, um, you know, it, I saw like Master of None and Aziz Ansari talked at length about like how South Asian actors only get auditions for the terrorist roles, right. and that was horrible. It was so deeply offensive. I felt terribly about that. And so, at the beginning of the casting process for for this character. Um, like I could have cast any race I wanted, you know, but but w- what I wanted to do was specifically to create a role for a South Asian or 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 uh, um, either Indian or Pakistani, you know. Like I was looking for that, and and that's a kind of a smaller acting pool in Hollywood, yeah. so it was hard. It was definitely a challenge for the casting department, uh, for Larray and and, and Julie, um, to to find somebody. Um, but I wanted to just do. M- I wanted to be part of the solution, I guess. I, I'm not trying to pat my sure, back sure. or anything, but I was just like, okay, I can I can do something to fix this in my own small way. And so so we created this role. Um, and then of course he has a family, and now suddenly I, I I'm starting to, you know, build out his world and and his you know, uh um Sunita plays his wife, Seema, and like, you know, we all all of a sudden have this 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 world. And the fact that he is a person of color didn't matter at all. Like he's just an American hero. Yeah. Like, and he's, he, you know, so, um, and, and that also was kind of the, the, I think the correct way to tell the story and, and not make a big deal out of his ethnicity. Sure. It literally is. He's just an American, you know? Yeah. yeah. So with a, he's a dad and husband. Yeah. Dad, a husband and, and, and a guy that uh, zigged when he should have zagged. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I mean, like any of us, like, you know, the, the the whole point of the way Fisk operated uh, was to employ the tactics of of, of like a intelligence operative, right? Uh, um, I, I think we mentioned this, but but you know, my dad worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA. He wrote a book with Robert Gates, the former Secretary of Defense and, and Director of Central Intelligence, wow. um, on how the intelligence business works. He's an academic and an expert in all that. But I grew up in in that world, and and I wanted to give Wilson Fisk a skill set which was representative of the more advanced tactics of of an intelligence oper- operator. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and what we see with the way that Fisk. Uh, uh, destabilizes the financial life of Ray Nadim months before he even meets him and then creates the conditions for Ray Nadim to see Fisk as his way out of financial hardship. What you're essentially watching is a, a fairly advanced recruitment effort by Fisk. It's the kind of thing that a KGB operative would do to a target or, or, or one of our own you know, intelligence services would do to, to a potential agent. Uh, an unwitting target. Uh, and that is what happens to Raina Deem. His financial hardship was orchestrated by Fisk. Mm. So. Um, what happens uh, in your first time being a showrunner and one of your main actors breaks his hand <laughs> trying, trying to do something and uh, it sets you back a, a bit? Does that stress you out? Um, well, you know, my first. I'm talking about Will, yeah, uh, Wilson yeah, yeah. broke his hand yeah. punch, punching a wall. Yeah, he 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 he, he accidentally missed a mark and 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 injured his hand. And and uh, um, my first concern was just to be a, a human being and make sure he was okay because I knew, like, aside from the physical pain, that he was going to feel awful yeah. about what had happened yeah, and blame and himself yeah. and guilt and knowing that, you know, I, I was worried that he would feel like he had let down the team and I wanted to impress upon him that that was ridiculous that accidents happen and that I, I admired his passion of, of being in the moment and so emotionally real in that scene that yeah. he literally he went for it. He went for it and he, and, and he, and he broke his hand by accident, but he didn't stop the mm-hmm. scene that you see in the show. He has a broken hand from the moment he punches the wall to the moment he flings that knife into the photo of Julie. He never stopped the take. He went on with a broken hand for Wait, minutes. So the this thing that we see, we see him breaking his yes. hand? 
Oh, really? Yes. I thought that was like, oh, no kidding. I thought that was another take or something. Nope. Oh, shit. So um, <laughs> oh, he kept Jesus. going and and <laughs> finished crazy. it. And, you know, he's such a great guy. I, like, I love Wilson Bethel. Like, and, and such a team player and, and so fun to work with and hilarious behind the camera. People won't realize how hilarious, especially when you crossed him with JLE behind the scenes. Yeah. It was like, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, I heard stories. Whenever I'm around, it's like, oh, the boss is here. Everybody pay attention and, and behave themselves. But I heard stories. But um, um, what do we do is, is you know, we, we, uh, we rearranged the shooting schedule so that he would have time to, to heal. Um, we That's the good thing about Netflix, right? Because they're, they're waiting to drop it all at once anyway. You could have that time to just, re- you know, take yeah. everything else. Yeah. Yeah, and and we we you know uh, productions carry uh, production insurance for things like this, so that you can offset some of the cost. It was not insignificant, but um, but again, it's like it all comes out in the wash. The show's a hit in large part because of the performance that that Wilson and others gave this season. Yeah. So like, you know, th- that's just part of the part of the process, unfortunately. Um, but he was. He, he felt awful and I felt awful that he felt awful because like it, it you know, it, it was just one of those things and, and the guy is a, a powerhouse. So, uh, you know, in the end, um, it was, it, it was fine. It all worked yeah. out. Well, I feel awful that you two felt awful. Thank you. Uh, so how do you, how do you choose your writers and your directors? Do you know these, these guys and how does that work? Um, in some cases, um, <clears throat> The Mar- Marvel executives are, are very good at, uh, about uh, creating availability lists, people who are available, because, of course, um, when you're staffing up a show both for writers and for directors, um, there are 400-plus television shows going on right now, and, mm-hmm. and the pool of people who are actually available is, is not that great. Mm-hmm. Um, so because, of course... Um, well, let, let's kind of take them separately for a second. So with the writing staff, um, I, I have a list of things that I want writers to be able to, to do. And, 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 um, so I knew that there were, there were components of the season that I, I wanted an expert in the room. For instance, he's a lawyer. I wanted a lawyer. I wanted somebody who was an expert in Catholicism or several people. I wanted people who are experts in the, the MCU. Uh, I wanted uh, people who could write in a style that was close enough to my own that I could teach them to write in my tone of voice because the scripts all need to have a, a unity to them. Sure. They can't, I, I can't send somebody off and have some iambic pentameter poem come back that is not something I can fill. Um, I needed people who were uh, good in a writer's room, like a, in a collaborative environment, who were were literally just nice people that got along with it, all of their other, you know, playmates. You know, like that. That's important. Um, I wanted a balance of men and women. I wanted a balance of of white and diversity. So, like. There, there was a list of, of things, and then y- you compare that with who's available, who's good, and it becomes an insane mad scramble. Oh, and also the price tags of various writers, and you have to work out the budget. And I mean, it is one of the early Herculean tasks of, of a sh- any showrunner is putting together your writing staff. The first calls that I made were to a writing team, Sam Ernst and Jim Dunn, whom I with whom I'd worked on another show years ago. And I knew that they were good. I knew that they were good managers. They actually had run a chain of restaurants together back in Minneapolis before they ever became writers and were, (coughs) excuse me, and were good managers of people. And, um, so I hired those guys and, and, um, they became my, my right hands, kind of my number twos is what, what the, what the writer's parlance came. But then, I also hired others to to make sure that we had the balances of diversity in men, men women, and, and, and all of those different various expertise represented in the writer's room. Because um, when we're breaking the stories, if, if something wasn't legally passing muster, I wanted the lawyer to say, hold on, it wouldn't work that way. Here's how it would work. Or, uh, and I wanted, you know, several fellow geeks that say like, oh, we could do this Easter egg here. I wanted, 
you know, uh, uh, J- Jim Dunn, the the one of the, uh, the my number twos, at, at one point when he was a kid wanted to become a priest, and he's Catholic and he's an expert in in a lot of the things that ended up making it to screen. So, you you kind of put together. I guess your baseball team, you could say. Yeah. I'm not a. I'm not fantasy, sports. I'm fantasy not. Team. Yeah, you put together your, your 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 fantasy team, and 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 then hope everybody gets along and works together, and it and it worked out, worked out <laughs> well. Um, um, now, similarly with directors, um, you know, Marvel, uh, the execs there like Tom Lieber and Devin Quinn and Giordano Guarino, and 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 uh, um, th- they kind of put together a, a list of available directors. And I met with every director in Hollywood during the staffing season. I met with so many directors. But again, and this is part and parcel um, of me wanting to be part of the, the solution, I wanted diversity you know, early on. So I was looking to balance um, um, the director lineup, and, and we did. We, we, we basically were, were split down the middle of, of diversity, not in women. And, 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 um, but also, that's like the last thing you look for. The first thing is, are they just good? You know, can they tell the story? Are they people who check out? Like, um, I make a lot of phone calls to, to, to people to find out how directors are to work with mm. because, um, as a showrunner, the actors and stuff, right? Too. They have to work with the actors, and and you know what I don't want is a rogue guest director who who goes off and makes an entire different kind of television show, uh, and and I'm put in an impossible position, you know, um, with the directors' union. You know, I, like I I need team players also who are all helping me tell this coherent narrative that we all uh, get together. So uh, to that end. Um, what I like to do with directors is uh, there's something there, there's several meetings that that occur between showrunners and and directors during the process and uh, one of the key meetings is something called the tone meeting. The tone meeting is literally a scene by scene page turn where the showrunner and the writer of the episode or sometimes just the showrunner explains to every guest director all the hit, the layers of a scene and how. Uh, we envisioned it and, and, and really gets into like what our hopes and dreams are for how the episode will turn out directorially and in terms of the coverage and in terms of all of that. And um, one of the things that I observed on the other shows that I, I've worked on is the tone meeting is often on the last day of pre-production, uh, last day of prep. And so um, I always thought that that was stupid. Mm. Um, I wanted to do that meeting on the first day of prep so that the director has the benefit of what it is I wanted him or her to go do. And they have the week and a half or a week of prep to then come back, come up with their own ideas, come back to me and say, Oh, I heard your idea, but I have a better version if we do this. Mm. So I can say, yes, that's better. Please go do your version. I like your version better. Or they can ask questions or they can, you know, so I rearranged the, the, pre-production schedule so that I was giving each director what he or she needed to do their best work again. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, and, um, so, so that was one thing that I, I kind of rearranged and, and honestly, it's just, it's just experience. You know, when you watch shows that are, are, um, functionally run and you learn what everybody's job is and, and you learn, like if I were them, what would I want from my boss? Like I try to be that boss. I try to give them that. And so, so, um, I wanted directors who were collaborative in that way and weren't like, okay, I got it. Thanks. I got this big resume. I'm going to go off and do my own version of daredevil now for my reel and screw you. And, you know, and there are some directors like that out there. Like you have to hire very carefully. Yeah. So, um, um, but in the end we had a, we had a terrific group of directors. Um, I, 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 I really was very proud of, of, the work that they all did, uh, it was it was coherent, and yet I can see the voice of each director in, in each episode. So, <laughs> um, when in um, uh, uh, in a writer's room, like what's day one look like in a writer's room? How do you start? Like talking um, to everybody as a group. How many writers do you have in there? Uh, well, we had um, let's see, not including me, we had Sam and Jim, Dara, Tamara. Uh, Sone, Tanya, Liwa, Sarah, 
and Dylan. So nine. Nine. And you, and that's ten. Yeah. Okay, right. so you had 10 of you. So what, what's the first thing you do? Well, like how, does it, um, how do you get the ball rolling there? Uh, I lay out like what it was. I, 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 I pitched to um, to Marvel and then to Netflix. I'm like, here's the season that I was envisioning. Um, but then I lead everybody through uh, exercises, which are way too nerdy to go into here, that, that dig deeper into everything uh, and, and try to identify. You mean like writing ex- exercises or what do you mean exercises? Yeah, the, there 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 are craft techniques to um, um, giving um, a season a, a, a cohesion uh, mm-hmm. that almost like I've never seen it done in a room. But I'm a big screenwriting nerd. Mm-hmm. Uh, the craft of screenwriting. One of the things that I put on the writers' room wall was a Jorge Luis Borges quote, which is, "Art equals fire plus algebra." Okay. And I believe that in my bones, that um, a lot of writers know the algebra, the craft of writing, how to write scenes, but they lack the fire. And the fire is, what are you writing about? What are you trying to say? What matters to you personally and emotionally so that you can apply the algebra of screenwriting technique and turn it into art? And um, one of the one of the kind of the screenwriting gurus that that I've read, and I've read pretty much all of them because I try to take something from everyone, but is Robert McKee, uh, and uh, he talks about an idea called the controlling idea. He has choose the, uh, uh, the 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 word theme because it's too kind of loosey goosey. It doesn't really uh, work for him. And anyway, he calls it con- the controlling idea, and. Um, in the very beginning of the season, um, the writers and I talked about what it was we were trying to say with the show. Uh, and it was a lot of work, but where we landed was uh, a notion that then we wrote up on the writer's room wall. And, and the principle was, um, um, we can only be free if we confront our fears because our fears are what enslave us. Our fears enslave us, right? And um, what that allowed me to do was to translate the story, that that controlling idea into every single character's arc over the season. So the hidden architecture of the season, aside from being the resistance of a, of a narcissistic tyrant rising to power and the prescription for how to defeat somebody like that. It is also about fear and about the fears which enslave each of us. Every single character on the show this season has a fear which they are conscious of or not conscious of, and that is fueling their actions. It's, it's driving the way that they behave. Um, Matt Murdock, even though he's not aware of it at the beginning of the season, fears abandonment. Um, If you look at the events of his life, it's pretty clear why. Like, everybody that gets close to him either dies or leaves him. Um, He very nearly comes close to, to, to abandoning himself in the final episode. If he had killed Fisk, he would have been abandoning who he was. So uh, he ultimately turns back from the darkness at the end. Fisk is driven by the fear that he is unworthy of the love of Vanessa because he was humiliated in front of her and hauled off to prison in season one. And everything that he does is driven by this fear that he is unworthy of her. Uh, All of his Machiavellian plots and manipulations all come back to the core idea that he is afraid that the woman he loves that he doesn't deserve her, that he's not worthy of her. Uh, In the case of Karen Page, she is uh, afraid that she's not a good person, that she's irredeemable. And it's the reason that she couldn't form meaningful emotional or romantic relationships in the early seasons. And it's the same reason that she's willing to go charge into Wilson Fisk's penthouse and challenge him to beat her to death so that he'll go to prison. Like uh, that's all driven by her fear that she will never be able to undo the harm she did by causing her brother's death in the backstory that we see in episode 10. Foggy fears that 
he won't live up to the expectations of his family that, that, uh, and, and that without Matt Murdoch, he doesn't know where he's going in his life. And he has to confront that fear. Um, Dex is afraid that, uh, he'll never be able to let his true self out because his true self that he has caged with medication and, and mental health help is a monster, is a sociopath, a borderline personality disorder. Ray is afraid that he'll never be able to live up to the expectations of his family. Ray is afraid that he's going to fail to be the breadwinner of, of his family. And, and that drives him to make some egotistical bad decisions that ultimately end up causing his downfall Mm -hmm. but by building that controlling idea into the season not only did it give a thematic unity to all of the different character arcs but it allowed us to say something larger about the world that we're all living in right now and again the idea that there are people out in the world um let's call them voldemort's um, there are Voldemort. <laughs> yeah, sing, yeah. There, there, there are villains in the world who use fear and hatred to turn us against one another, to and 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 to make us afraid to vote, or make us afraid not to vote for him, mm-hmm. or like um, pit us against one another. And and if you look at, if you look at, and it, that's not just domestically. I mean, you look at any corner of the world right now. Like there are people who use fear and to, to, to speak to people's worst demons instead of their better angels. And, and um, I wanted the show to say something meaningful about the world. Um, I, I figured if I was going to be given the flagship of the Marvel television world that I knew was going to be watched by tens of millions of people that I wanted to say something that was ultimately positive and hopeful, and but also sophisticated, hopefully, and prescriptive. Again, it was like it's one thing to criticize the the way the world works; it's another to offer solutions. And to me, the the prescription for how to defeat a tyrant, uh, the rise of a dictator, was the power of the free press. Um, the power of the law and the power of collective action. And so this architecture, this kind of hidden architecture beneath the surface of season three allowed me to do all of those things. Uh, two questions. Uh, were, what, was there talk about Matt Murdock does not wear the Daredevil suit at all in season three. Uh, was there talk about getting him into that, into that suit at some point? And also the second question is, was there any talk about for me, it felt like Fisk was on the rise to becoming a politician. And I know that there's <laughs> recent storylines where he becomes a mayor or something. Um, I didn't read it, but uh, I know a little bit about it. Well, that. that one first. Like, uh, again, um, as I told Loeb and everybody at the beginning of the season, I wanted, you know, uh, uh, and I got their blessing to kind of treat season three as my run of the comics. Like, I knew that a certain shape for Wilson Fisk would have to happen for it to, to, to reflect the story that I just described and, and the goals of the story. So um, I wasn't interested in building him into the mayor. Uh, that, that wasn't really what I was like. I, I certainly think that had events turned out differently in season four, I think maybe that might've been his long-term plan and who knows what the future holds. He still exists in the world. You know, he's a wily one that Wilson Fisk, um, but I didn't want to tackle that this season. And then, what was your first question? I'm sorry. Um, uh, the Daredevil costume. Oh, right. Um, so, so there were a couple uh, things that, that went into that. Um, um, there's kind of the story reason and then the storyteller's reason. Um, the story reason was um, Matt Murdock had a building fall on him. They had to cut him out of the suit in order to save his life and... Um, the suit is destroyed, right? So uh, I liked that um, he was, uh, like he's in this incredibly dark place, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And I liked that the black kind of suit 
is representative of that, of that metaphorically. Also, the suit doesn't exist, right? It, it was destroyed. And so... Um, um, but he does run into Melvin again. You could possibly get him to build another you suit know, or something. It, the storyteller's reason was that um, we knew we wanted to do the um, the fake Daredevil or the, the swap and yeah. put Bullseye in the in the Daredevil thing. So, so um, like... For, for multiple reasons, it made more sense. But Matt Murdock feels like he has outgrown the symbol of Daredevil at the beginning of the season. First right. of all, he's physically incapable of yeah. being Daredevil, right? He's deaf in one ear, so his radar sense is all messed up. He kind of recovers more slowly across the first episodes and, and has to build back up. But again, when it comes to the stunt sequences, right? Um, and I talked about this with the stunt department. I wanted... You know, Matt is carrying scar tissue from the building falling on him in Defenders. I wanted to get in close. Like, he's back to being the boxer's son. He's a close quarters fighter. Like, and Jeff Loeb and I discussed uh, at the beginning of the season, in a lot of ways, um, in, in the show, suddenly Daredevil took on almost Iron Fist abilities of, like, Kung Fu and all this other stuff that really aren't the comics, right? It, it, it started to kind of migrate towards that because um, some folks wanted to just make it more spectacular. And, and, um, and, you know, and, and for me, that wasn't the kind of storytelling I wanted to tell. Again, I wanted to tell kind of this emotionally bonded, deep point of view type of story. Um, I did not want to do a whole bunch of wire stunts. To me, that takes the audience out of it. It looks like you're doing a stylized fight sequence. And and I wanted a gritty, grounded, visceral feel to the season um, that necessitated um, a different approach to the Suns in the, in the beginning of the season. And, and, and we carried that, carried that forward. So um, how many takes, I mean, you're, you're in LA, right? When the show shoots, you're mostly in LA, you go visit. In New York, right? Uh, yeah, I, I I go back and forth to New York as as much as I can. You the know, the writers' I, room is L.A. The writers' room is in L.A. Like <laughs> I, I, you know, I have, you know, it, it, it it's it's kind of I have a weird job. I have like five full time jobs, five full time families. Like one of them is the writers' room, one of them is the cast, one of them is production, and all of the you know the the, the plates of that. One of them is is post production, the editorial staff and the music, and the, and then the last is of course all of the executives. Like there are many executives at Marvel and at Netflix, and and I have to constantly keep them apprised of everything that we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're spending the money and why and all of that. So um, um, it's not always possible for me to get on a plane and go to New York to take care of the cast and the production families. Cause I have the three other families sure. in LA that need me at the same time. Um, but yeah, I, I go back and forth as much as physically possible, uh, so that I can, uh, um, be a part of it. I love that process. Yeah. Uh, do you know how many times, uh, that one shot was shot? Yes. Um, um, that was take seven. That was the final, but there were a few false starts, Okay. on it so it was actually the f- the third full take um they they that knew we see that, that we see yes you saw the final take that was take number seven the um, third full there, take. yes that was a third f- they got one that they thought worked pretty well early on then they had some false starts then they got another one that didn't quite work that well and then they thought now nah, maybe we'll just have to go with take one um and and they were debating whether or not the crew had the energy to do it yet again because mm. that is a huge and elaborate sequence. Because <clears throat> um, you have to. But what they did, the the, the assistant director su- suggested they all go to lunch, and right after lunch, the crew came back and and knocked it out of the park. Everybody, I guess, had caffeination and calories in their in their blood, right. and they ended up doing the version that is now going to uh, forever set a bar for. Uh, for this show, if not yeah. others, in terms of action sequence. Because in between, if you do another take, you have to go back. Even if you have a false start, there's like a lot of prep now you have to do. You have to clean up yeah, the, the set. You have to clean up the actors. You, there's a lot of – you have to redo, you know, replace props and all that yeah. shit, right? Yeah. That's a lot of shit. That's a lot. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's a lot. Uh, all right, let's talk about your origin story. You were born in Washington, D.C.? Uh, I was born in Washington, yeah. 
Um, did you live there? Did you raised? Um, um, only the first couple of days of my life, only and then my days? my parents. Well, no, I, I I was born in Washington D.C., and then my parents at the time had had a, a home in Northern Virginia, and then um, uh, basically at age two, I moved to, into a house that I lived in until I went to college. So uh, in, Fairfax, in Fairfax County, Virginia. Yeah. Um, and you, t- you said your dad was a sp- like a spy. Not a spy. Nice. My dad was an intelligence uh, official, so like it was never he was never like an undercover or anything like that. He he, well, I shouldn't say that. In Vietnam, he was in the Air Force, and he he was involved uh, with the CIA and Air America, um, um, and and played some. I, I don't know if I can fully talk about that part, but mm. um, yeah, um, but later on he he is basic, he still wor- is he retired? He's or? retired now. He's retired yeah, now. But but he uh, um, like he he worked in and out of government all through my my childhood years. He he uh, worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency where uh, he had a job that doesn't even exist anymore. But the t- the I think the official title was assistant. Director for Operations, Plans, and Policy. So it was like a, it was like a. Um, so he, he was he was. Uh, I just remember as a kid, I uh, watched a general call my dad sir, and I thought, oh, that's awesome. Um, and uh, you know, so so yeah, I grew up I grew up in that world. Did did he ever sneak onto a movie set and become a PA? He did not. Mm. He did not. So I, I wound up him on that one. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's funny because in my early, in my early career, I was, I was struggling to make the rent and, and get into this ridiculous racket. I, I, I constantly was thinking that at my age, my father was fighting in Vietnam. So I was like, I, I, I was like, wow, I'm so incredibly lucky and spoiled and, and, uh, um, aware that uh um if i ever made it i was gonna have to do something to uh to make it worth it <laughs> yeah we, we, uh, are your parents still together they are yeah yeah um, married. Uh, they live in honolulu my sister's a professor at the university of hawaii ooh. um and uh, uh she has a a, a daughter uh beatrix puakala oliver mm, uh Pua. yeah she's 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 native born hawaiian nice. um and uh um, yeah, and and my brother currently lives in Sydney, but he was running an internet company in Jakarta until recently, and he oh. s- he sold it to Alibaba. So Ooh. he's been a bum and just surfing in Sydney on Bondi Beach. And uh, so he's retired. Yeah, uh, you know, he's yeah. five years younger. I don't think he's quite ready to be retired <laughs> yet, but he'll go start some other internet company. And, Jeez. and uh, uh, sounds like you guys are a bunch of smarties. <laughs> Yeah, I'm yeah. the dumb one, honestly. My sister, <laughs> my sister, uh, you know, my sister and brother both are, are pretty insanely smart. So, uh, what you're doing is so different than what everybody else is doing you yeah. know, on the creative <laughs> side. Well, you know, it's funny because they're both engineers. Um, I mean, my sister has a couple of master's degrees and then a PhD from Stanford, and she's like an environmental engineer and mm. an economist, and and is trying to save the world. And and her husband is a marine biologist trying to save the world's coral reefs, and 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 she's a real environmental do-gooder. Um, and my brother graduated early from MIT, and he's an engineer, you know. And and um, and then I went and I just became a Hollywood snowflake. We went um, to Tish. Uh, I did. I went to Tisch school, school of the Arts. Yeah, That's it was good. good. Um, but you know what? It's surprising because I think um, there's a lot of engineering in designing a television series and and running a television show. So in some ways, I guess I am part engineer. Well, yeah. I mean, you do give yourself, or at least you, you, the, from what you said, you, there's a lot of rules. There's Yeah, there's well, there's a lot of structure. Structure yes. and rules, and here's what I... What what I want and how, how it should be. You know, well, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. You have to design the blueprint of the season and communicate it. I mean, it, it, it's it's no good for a showrunner to be a talented writer but incapable of communicating what he or she wants to the people who go out and execute it. Like, you need to be able to teach people what it is you want so that they can all work in unison to achieve it. So I, I guess in that regard, I, I, I think like an engineer. Are your uh, siblings older, younger? Uh, both younger. Both are younger. You're the, old, you're I'm the, the old oldest. Man. I'm the oldest. That's yeah. interesting. Did they look up to you growing up? Um, you know, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. I look up to them too for different reasons, but yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, do they uh, do they watch your shows? Um, they are currently texting me with glee about this show. Um, yeah. They haven't watched all of my shows, nor should anyone. By the way, <laughs> I've worked on a lot of really bad TV shows. Uh, you know, as you're coming up the ranks as a television writer, um, you're kind of at the mercy of of what show has a slot available that will hire you and who are your agents friends with, you know, and, and as I was building my career, I had some, I had some stinkers on there, but I had some other really great ones on there too. And, yeah. and you learn from all of them. But, yeah. yeah. what did your mom do growing up? Uh, she was a stay at home mom. She was mm-hmm. a Dutch immigrant and my mm-hmm. mom, um, my, my maternal grandmother immigrated to the United States, um, with my mother when she was 15 and, 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 then my mom went to AU and the Berkeley and, and it was like ultra liberal who married the CIA guy, you know? So it's just like, <laughs> how'd they meet? Um, at an apartment complex outside, outside Washington, DC, there was a, a apartment complex where my dad was living while he was stationed at the Pentagon. So is your dad liberal? My, my father now is, is a registered Democrat, but, uh, growing up he was Republican or independent. Um, you know, I, he comes from, a more conservative background and certainly like as a part of the defense intelligence establishment. So sure. that's a generally conservative, uh, conservative yeah. uh, you know, in, in, in conservative it, back then meant some different. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> conservative, yes. Like, conservative back then were, yeah, it was a whole different world. It, it's like, you know, I, I, I miss those conservatives. Yeah. Like you can have meaningful, they got rid of, they got rid of Nixon. Right, so yeah, the, well, yeah, but you know, they were also <laughs> strong defense. That I mean, there, there there were a lot of really positive, yeah, kind of attributes of of conservative thinkers, you know, and and like personally, like growing up in a household where there was a balance, I miss that balance. I miss having kind of an intelligent conversation about different ways of tackling problems and mm. and and then finding commonalities and common ground and working together like that simply does not exist anymore now it's the ultra right and the ultra left and it's 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 uh, exactly the way uh Vladimir Putin wants it yeah well you know, it's interesting though that you said that uh we want some more balance and from what you described as that balance you do that on your show yeah like, you know, yeah no I, I mean compromise and stuff yeah, no, I like I like I think that uh um the world would be a better place if we all imagined ourselves in the shoes of the person that we are in oppos- that we are opposing before we speak or act. Like trying to imagine where the other person is coming from um and empathizing with why they believe what they believe and why they think what they think would get us a long way away from this screaming at one another and towards a more cooperative future. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I just, people need to calm down. <laughs> and unfortunately, there are a lot of forces working against that, including foreign intelligence services that are very interested in in um, pitting us against one another and weakening us and, and, and Western liberal democracies using fear and hatred and and agents unwitting or witting that they place in in political offices and and uh leadership roles in the west and and um disinformation campaigns i mean what what i think we're living through right now is is the result of a of a very sophisticated and aggressive informational war we are we are at war right now and most people don't realize that Thank you for bumming me out. <laughs> you know what? We'll just solve it all with Daredevil. What if we, your dad goes back to work? Would that help? You know, he's, <laughs> he's an old fart now. You know, it's just like, <laughs> let him play croquet in Hawaii. He's like, I'm in Hawaii, dude. Leave me alone. <laughs> um, what, what about some of those other movies that you mentioned? You weren't credited on IMDb for those, but you mentioned like uh, uh, JFK and, and Days of Thunder. What was it like working around like Oliver Stone and, and uh, Tom Cruise and those guys? Well, look, I mean, I, like the, I snuck onto a lot of movie sets when I was a kid yeah. and I became kind of unofficial PAs. And one of the reasons none of it's on my IMDb page is like that didn't exist back then. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, I'm only 45, but I don't want to like age out of Hollywood. People are like, oh my God, he worked on a movie in 1987. We can't hire him. He's too old. Right. Um, you know, um, it, it, it's, um, you know, 
it was it was awesome. Like I I got bit by the bug early. It was like I think honestly, like one of my first days on the center broadcast news, um, I, I went into the catering tent during the crew lunch, and it was I guess a special occasion or whatever. But it was four stars catering, and the and it was lobster tails and beef Wellington and a dessert platter, and I'm like oh my God, I'm getting into Hollywood. If I can eat like this, this is my future. This is all I want to do. So it may actually, EJ, have come back to the food. You know, I'm six foot eight inches tall. I'm 300 plus pounds. And you know what? I like food. And so uh, um, it's, Me you know. Me too, man. Me too. Uh, have you always been that tall? How tall? Uh, how long have you been this tall? Um, tall. Yeah, I I'm came tall. out this I'm, way. I'm 6'3". <laughs> And I'm like, and I'm pretty tall. And whenever I meet somebody like your height, I'm like, whoa, that is tall. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm too big. You know, I'm, I'm, it's Bump very hard to get, yeah, it's hard to get cars or clothes or yeah. beds or plane tickets or anything. It's kind of a pain in the ass. Yes, um, but, I but um, I was always the tallest in every class I was ever in mm-hmm. going back to kindergarten. And, and uh, yeah, I was always tall. Me but too. I was, but but I made for up for it by being very very uncoordinated. Oh, perfect. So yeah, so it was <laughs> awesome when everybody looked at me and thought, "Oh, great, he's going to be the center of the basketball team." Until they saw me try to dribble, That's and the then exact they're like, "Same way with you're me. going to warm the bench." Same exact thing with me. Uh, that's so funny. Were, were you like self conscious about it growing up? Your height? No, not really. No, I mean, okay. it's just like, well, I mean, I suppose maybe I, like I don't. I don't remember being self-conscious about my height. It's it's more like conscious that I'm living amongst the Smurfs. <laughs> <laughs> Who else is in your? Where did you get your height from? Your dad tall? Yeah, he's well. He's six three. And my mom's five nine. Okay, so you are you the tallest? You must be the tallest. Yeah, I'm the family, tallest. Right? I, I'm actually like a quarter of an inch taller than my little brother, and it really pisses him off. Wow, he's he's six. Seven or whatever, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. that's a that was, damn. Your mom was like taking hormones or something. Well, her her, her joke is that uh, um, we drank so much milk, and the, the cows were probably given growth hormones, <laughs> and and my brother and I each drank like a gallon of milk every day growing up as teenagers. <laughs> oh, is your or that title for your father was that assistant director defense. It was the, okay, I believe the official agency. title, let me try to get this right. At the time, and this is, we're talking the 1980s, right? We're talking, uh, was the Assistant Deputy Director for Operations, Plans, and Policy of the Defense Intelligence Agency. That was the last like big fancy title <laughs> that my dad, yeah. And and there's an adage in government, the longer your title, the yeah. lower down the, the the chain of command you are. But, but you know, he, he was... Um, he was one of the the first members of the senior executive service, which is kind of the civilian equivalent of a general. Um, you know, when you get into the uh, like the government pay scale. So my dad was like the equivalent of a one or a two star general. Mm. Wow, that's pretty awesome though. Um, did you ever think about going in the military? I did um, yeah. briefly when I was a kid. Of course, I got bit by this bug at age sure. thirteen, but uh, I was too tall for the navy. Um, and too tall for some um, reasons. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's. Um, I, I thought about it, like, uh, but ultimately, I, I just I knew what I wanted to do with my life at age twelve, even yeah. even before I stuck out of broadcast news. I was writing, you know, my, my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Virginia Payne, Clifton Elementary School, told my parents that I would make my living as a writer. Wow, and. Um, when I was 12, there was a TV show called Amazing Stories on NBC. It was a Steven, yeah, Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. Yeah, yeah. It was like 20 and Like, I was that crazy fan that was writing ideas for the show on lined school paper, like mm-hmm. that you use sure. in whatever grade I was in when I was that young. And I started mailing it to Amblin. And then I, I, I started calling them and saying, did you get my idea? And, and, <laughs> and eventually, I called so often, I eventually got through to Kathleen Kennedy. Wow. And she said, this is very cute, but you got to stop. <laughs> You're bothering my assistant, <laughs> you know? Um, now, cut to, cut to, I'm out of NYU, and, and I'm working in Hollywood, and I'd been working around, and, and I was a script reader, and I became a reader at Kennedy Marshall. And at one of the holiday parties... I went up to Kathy and I said, hey, I, you know, 
do you remember this kid? And and she gasped and, uh, and, and she sent me home with all the holiday party leftovers, you know, uh, like it was so, so occasionally I'll run into Kathy and Frank and, and, you know, I mean, uh, they're, they've to this day are idols of mine, you know, oh, and, wow. and, 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 uh, um, yeah. So, so like, but I, I just knew like at age 12 that I was going to do this for a living. So, um, I, I briefly worked an internship at the U S Senate. Like my dad hooked me up with some various things and, and, and I had an opportunity to go do a documentary after film school for the CIA, but it would have required me to get a security clearance and forever more submit my writing to the CIA for review before it would be allowed to be published or so I would have given the government basically veto power over anything I would write for the rest of my life and I thought I'm not going to do that so so I ultimately didn't do it that's crazy yeah that's crazy um do you know that um uh, I'm in a documentary that uh uh Frank Marshall produced oh no I didn't know that yeah it's called Running Blind it's available on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon. Digital copies. Awesome. Awesome. Well, he's, check he's a great guy. Yeah, it was very, very, very nice of him to do that. Uh, 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 yeah, so you also were uh, Hey, just to, just ask, like, how yep. many more you got? I'm running out of steam here a little couple, bit. A couple more. Okay. We're almost done. All right, all right, all right. Almost done. <laughs> um, so you, you were a reader for Kathleen Kennedy, but also Chris Columbus and Jeffrey Katzenberger? Right? Yeah, so, 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 so... Uh, Oh man, so you're taking me back here. So so yeah. the 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 <laughs> so like after I did all those PA gigs, um, I, I I directed a like a television public service announcement right after high school after a friend of mine was in a car accident, and mm. then I went to NYU Film and I started doing a bunch of public service announcements. So I was like that guy at NYU who had all this real world movie experience, and I became kind of the guy that. I was a freshman, but all the seniors at NYU Film wanted me to produce their film because I had hookups at all the camera houses and I knew how to go make a movie. So I was producing like three senior thesis films as a freshman. And uh, at the same time, I was directing public service announcements. So I was I was really, I wanted to be the hair, man. I wanted to conquer Hollywood. Like I wanted to kick ass like <laughs> at age 18, 19. And I, I wrote a... a uh, I, I had a friend who who, who contracted uh, HIV and, and died of AIDS uh, from a blood transfusion, and I wrote an after school special. And this was eons ago um, when I was back, like before it was really widely known. I wrote an after school special about how you could contract HIV, and and um, I, I through uh, elbow grease convinced some some friends in the Amblin. Uh, world to help me try to get it made. And so um, I went, I came out, I took a semester off of NYU and I came out to LA and, and there were a number of producers who were trying to help me get it made and were writing letters of support. Uh, uh, and um, I was trying to finance it with the, 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 through, through the drug companies, through, through Pfizer and others. And, and ultimately I couldn't raise the money to, to make it happen. And I went back to NYU and I finished film school and then I came out and um, some of my kind of my network of friends from working on the movie sets and 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 um, friends that had tried to help me get that show made said, Eric, you really need to go learn how Hollywood works. You need to get an assistant job and work your way from the, you know up from the bottom. And um, you know I uh, I took that on board and and a friend of mine, Bob Gale, who wrote Back to the Future. Yes, my favorite movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Bob, um, um, and I, I had like an informational interview with him. I just, I hung out with him and, and, and then he met a producer who was looking for an assistant and, and um, he recommended me and I ended up working for a producer named Carol Baum uh, who had a deal at Columbia Pictures, was making a movie called Fly Away Home, uh, Carol mm-hmm. Ballard film. And, and so I worked for her. Yeah, for, in there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and so I worked on, I worked for her for a little less than a year. Uh, and around that time said, you know, I, I really want to go be a writer. And, and so I, I left that and I became a reader, which, you know, which, you know, uh, is, is basically making a hundred bucks for a script and you read a script and you, and you do a book report for a agent or a producer or whatever so that the next morning they can just read the the coverage it's called right. basically the the short book report on it and then same thing with novels but i i ended up my clients at that point were 
Steven Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Kathy Kennedy, Frank Marshall, Alan Ladd, Chris Columbus. So like between those six people, I had a constant volume of scripts and books coming my way that like I would get a Mario Puzo galleys, like a, like this gigantic novel from the the writer of Godfather. And I would have to read it overnight Uh. and write up a book report of eight to 10 pages and turn it in by 9 a.m. the next morning. And um, what I quickly learned was that was job awesome. was completely a burnout job. Like, yeah. there was no time to be a writer. And um, these were my salad days, right? This, like, it was barely, you were barely able to make your rent doing that job. It was really tough. Um, and, and a burnout, like it robbed me. I became a speed reader, but, um, it, it burns you out. You're lo- if you're, if you love reading, that's the worst job in the world because right. <laughs> like you, you no longer appreciate the written word. You're just looking at trying to quickly process an idea so that you can write your book report, right? Yeah. Your coverage. Um, and so I, I got out of that racket. Can I um, do before? Yeah. Did, did you, any of those that you read become actual movies? Um, No. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, I, one, but I don't want to claim credit for it. Okay. All right. That's fine. Um, um, but um, so, so I ended up, uh, um, oh, what the hell? Six Cents. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, I love Six Cents. Yeah. I came to Kathy and Frank from... Sam Mercer, and, and yeah, that was, that was one that I did cover. So. Shyamalan um, owes you. <laughs> no, no, I, it would have gotten made anyway. That was a great film. Yeah. Um, but um, um, so, um, is this even moderately interesting to you? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm just going, anyway. So it's been almost so, two hours. It's all interesting. Oh so so um, anyway, so um, I wrote a, I wrote a, I wrote a movie. Um, uh, I struggled for a while, but I wrote my first film, which was. Uh, uh, called the fall of Troy. And it was about a, it was a murder mystery set in Virginia and it starred an African American news reporter. Um, and, um, what I didn't realize, like nobody was writing, a, a car- you know, movies for, for African American leads. And like, I, I ironically became a name on the list of the hot young black writers in Hollywood. <laughs> Uh, Ice Cube wanted to star in the movie at one point at New Line. Like I met with every black star in, in Hollywood, and a lot of them were saying, "Like we expected this angry guy from the projects, and you're this tall, happy white motherfucker from Virginia. Like what happened? How did this happen? Like how did you write this script?" And um, you know, in any case, it it it, uh, it didn't get made, but it put me on the map, and I ended up doing uh, rewrites on a lot of. Hollywood studio movies that never got made, uh, but kind of got me in the union. And, and it was, it was, it was frustrating to kind of work as a feature writer where you'd be pitted against other writers for jobs and you'd end up working six months on something and not see a paycheck. And, and it was, it was kind of an awful, awful way to exist. Uh, and then a friend of mine who was working for a movie producer named Wolfgang, uh, Peterson, um, who, uh, uh, perfect storm. Yeah. Perfect storm. Um, he had a television series called, um, the agency about the CIA on CBS. And, um, I went in and I met, I sat down and, and, and pitched a whole bunch of real life CIA stories that could be episodes. And, and I got hired that day. They were like, Oh my God. Oh, but it was just kismet. Right. I mean, here was a television series about the thing that I knew more about than probably, most writers in Hollywood because my dad did it. And my dad gave me a whole bunch of great stories to just take to the job interview. So, so I walked in and I I won the job and then it was the second of, of season and they already knew they were getting canceled. There was only nine episodes left and they let me write seven of them. And, and that kind of put me on the map for a lot of TV executives. They're like, who is this kid? And, and, and then that led to 15 other jobs over the years before I got to, got to run, the show. Are you looking for your next job? Uh, whatever your next job might be after uh, working with Marvel, do you want to? Do you have a show idea of your own, completely original? That I you're do. Like, I, I wanna, do. This yeah. is what I want to do at some point. Yeah, I've I've got several of them. Um, Give me all of them. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. Hollywood's in a weird place right now. Their uh, original ideas seem to seems to be a bad word uh, amongst buyers. They want. 
pre-existing they IP. Want a, they want that, a, uh, an audience already. Yeah, they want yeah. an audience already. So, um, but we'll see. You know, maybe what I'll do is I'll take my idea and I'll hire somebody who, who will make the comic book. And mm. then I'll I'll come back and, and do it that sure. way. Yeah. Backdoor it. I don't know. There's a we'll Guillermo del Toro does sometimps. Yeah, you know. It, it, yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, hey man. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you. Uh do you want to plug anything? Obviously Daredevil season three out right this second. Yeah, go vote. Go vote November sixth. God, you, go vote. You, Everybody just vote. I don't care how you vote, just vote. We need a wide I participation. Care how you vote. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely care. Uh, you have dual citizenship in the Nether- Netherlands and here. Is I do. Is that true? Yeah. My you, mom's du- it was a Dutch citizen and I, I got my dual citizenship a few years ago and, and uh, now if things go badly I can flee to Europe. That's good. Are you gonna vote over there? No, no, no. I only <laughs> vote here. <laughs> uh, well November sixth is also my birthday. Okay, so I'm please make the right wish. Yes. Make the right wish, EJ. Yes. We're counting on you. Oh, and don't tell anybody what the wish is, because we'll blame you if it goes bad. <laughs> uh, but you, you're on the socials. You're on uh, Instagram, kind of. Yeah, like I'm on Yeah, posts. I'm. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Twitter, at Eric Olson, E-R-I-K-O-L-E-S-O-N, and uh, um, Facebook and all that stuff, yeah. All right. Thanks, man. All right, man. And scene. There you go, folks. That was my talk with Eric Olson. Thanks so much, Eric, for coming in and talking with me for for two hours. Um, That was great. And uh, I feel like I learned a lot about being a writer uh, on a show, Um, which is always kind of fascinating to me. I always wanted to be like in in a writer's room like that. Even if I'm not participating, it'd just be interesting to watch. Anyway, thanks for coming in, Eric, and talking with me. So go check out Daredevil Season 3. Watch it over and over again. Hopefully you already watched it by the time you listen to this podcast. Um, There you go, folks. That's it for today. Do me a favor. Go on iTunes and leave a rating and a review for for my podcast. Uh, That would be a great help. Um, And also, one more time for my plugs at... EJ Scott on Twitter at EJ Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, EJ Scott1106, EJScott.com is my website, Running Blind Documentary on iTunes, Google Play, or Amazon, curechm.org to learn more about Croydoremia or to donate. That is it. Go subscribe to my podcast on iTunes and iHeartRadio and listen to my past podcasts. Check out my future ones. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.